questions. Um, so thank you everyone for coming out tonight um, for starting a business in Maryland. Um, this uh, class has been uh, brought to us through a partnership um, with the library and the Howard County Bar Association. Um, so I wanna give a big shout out to them for helping us out tonight. Um, just a few house housekeeping things before we get started. Um, the, the class is gonna be recorded. So if you miss anything or have to sk skedaddle a little early, um, you will be able to view it um, later on on our YouTube channel. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, we will be taking questions throughout so you can utilize the chat. Um, it is meeting format. So if you wanna unmute, uh, share a question or anything like that, there will be opportunities for you to do that also. Um, so with that, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I will turn it over um, to David Coxum from the Howard County Bar Association to get us started. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure on behalf of the Howard County Bar Association to join the Howard County Library System to present the second in a series of community-based presentations to the Howard County community at large. Uh, Rohini, I really appreciate you initially reaching out to me to discuss how we can add value to the community through programs that you present as the adult uh, curriculum specialist with the library system. Uh, for those not aware, uh, many of the counties in this state and in most states have an association commonly referred to as a bar association. Uh, it's an association of members of the local community who are licensed attorneys, judges, and some are active or retired uh, members of the bar as well. Here in Howard County, we have the Howard County Bar Association comprised of our own judges and retired and licensed Maryland attorneys who either live in or work in Howard County. Our bar association, sometimes referred to as the HCBA, was organized in 1941. Our mission is to promote excellence in the practice of law. And our purpose is also to administer justice, justice through service, education, advocacy, and collegiality for the benefit of the community. Uh, one of our commitments as well is to bring value to the community with seminars that are helpful and informational, like today's seminar. The collaboration with the Howard County Library System is a part of that effort to bring value to the community at large. It's important to note that during these seminars, we are uh, providing guidance. We're not providing legal advice or counsel. Legal counsel can only be provided as it may relate directly to your situation after establishing a relationship with your chosen lawyer or counselor for assistance. Our first collaboration with the library system was held on September the 18th of 2021, and it was a huge success. We provided information about getting a fresh start by expunging records from the court's case management system. For many individuals seeking a fresh start, and with so many employers having stringent application checks, it can be difficult to pass that first background check before you can be considered for employment or even to rent an apartment. The seminar was led by attorney Bradley Shepard and assistant county prosecutor Natasha Blount, who are both co-chairs of our criminal law section in the Howard County Bar Association. This is our second collaboration with the library system, focusing on educating you on the tips and knowledge base needed to start your own business. As our presenter for this evening, we have our very own Kristen Lohmeyer, a principal at Ally Legal Planning, a law firm located here in Columbia, Maryland. Her firm focuses on business law and succession planning, as well as elder law and estate planning. Kristen is the current chair of our business and real estate section of the Howard County Bar Association. She counsels individuals, families, and business owners, helping them understand and navigate the law. She creates plans for her clients to effectively care for their loved ones and protect and transfer their assets. Crichton's background includes civil and transactional matters working with small to medium-sized businesses throughout Maryland. Her litigation and business experience is integral to assisting business owners with their succession planning needs. Kristen offers a fresh perspective and strategic counselor 
to a wide variety of, of clients. She's a native of Howard County, and she graduated with honors from the University of Baltimore School of Law. And she has a degree in business administration as well. And so without further ado, I'm happy and proud to present Kristen to you. Thank you so much, David. And, and thank you to the Howard County uh, Library System for, for putting this on. Um, I particularly love talking about this topic because I love the energy um, that people bring to the table when they're starting out in their business venture. And additionally, I, I think if you take a proactive approach in the beginning and set yourself up correctly from the start, you are way ahead of the game and you can save yourself a lot of heartache along the way. So I'm very uh, happy to be here and I um, have made sure to put in some very uh, practical uh, information and steps into this uh, presentation for you tonight. So what I'm gonna do is share my screen for a PowerPoint. And as you will see here, um, this is the agenda for tonight. So what I would like to do is uh, start with each topic. During the topic, fee, uh, feel free to put any questions that you have regarding the topic in the Q&A box. And then before I move on to the next section, we'll go ahead and stop and we can we can talk about that um, and answer the questions that you have. So don't be shy. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is selecting the business structure for your business. I'm gonna talk about the four common business structures and really what you're going to see as a common thread is really the considerations that go into picking your ultimate business structure. And you're gonna see woven throughout that there's liability considerations, there's owner considerations, the numbers and types of owners, as well as tax considerations. So with that, I'm going to talk first about the, the most simplest and um, I guess first business structure that you run into. If you were to make something in your home, and sell it to somebody, you're effectively in business for yourself as a sole proprietor. You are one in the same, the own business and the individual. There's no separation. Um, this is the very first stepping stone to many businesses. Um, there's no formal requirement to start this business. It's essentially you doing what you want to do. Um, you don't have to file anything with the state you do have the ability to file a trade name, which is a name other than your own, um, but it's not a separate entity from you. So you have all the reward, but you carry all the risk. So what this means is that if something were to happen negatively, any personal assets that you own could be um, attached to or, or taken to satisfy a debt of the business. So why would somebody want to do this, considering there is a lot of uh, personal liability? This is sometimes something that people will do to start out and see, does my business have some traction? You may see some people take this approach. Uh, maybe they create some products, they realize there's a market, and then they move on with one of the next business structures that we'll talk about. If you have a business that's really um, low in liability, this is maybe something that you want to start with. But this is the most, um, I'd say, risky venture, because as I mentioned before, you are one in the same, the business, and you are subjected to all the obligations and the debts and liabilities of the business. So moving on to a partnership, a general partnership is essentially a sole proprietorship, but with more than, than one owner. So it doesn't have to be two, it can be more than one. The owners of the business are referred to as partners and partners are also personally liable for the obligations of the business. So again, this isn't a, um, an extremely protective type of business uh, entity structure. The profits and losses are gonna be passed through to the partners. And what you need to understand is that when a partner receives the money, they may be taking that money and thinking, okay, say the business made $100,000. My partner and I each took $20,000 from the business. You're going to be taxed on the $100,000 on the net income, regardless of whether 
the full 100,000 was actually distributed to you. So that's something that people sometimes uh, overlook or may not know about when they're talking about a partnership. There's multiple uh, versions and variations of a partnership. And what you'll see here is that as we progress, you get more and more liability protection, but it also becomes uh, more and more strict and stringent on the requirements to set these businesses up. Again, a general partnership is very easy to start up um, and it's, you know, it has less requirements, formal requirements than other businesses. So the limited partnership is a partnership that you will actually file with the state of Maryland to register the business. And this is typically seen when you have one individual who's going to be very hands-on managing the business. And then you may have somebody who's not so hands-on, but more of an investor. And what this type of structure does is it provides some limited liability to the individual who's not doing the hands-on managing. So you get some liability protection, but you have limited control. So there's some trade-offs. But again, this is another situation. It's taxed like the general partnership. So you can see this limited partnership is a step above the general partnership. There's a bit of liability protection, but it is limited. And then we also have something in Maryland called a limited liability partnership. So this, again, you have to file with the state of Maryland, um, but every partner gets liability protection for the obligation and debts of the company. So what I wanna caveat right now from the get-go, cause you're gonna hear me say, as we continue to go on liability protection from the partnership obligation and debts, that is, something that you need to understand doesn't, it, it doesn't stretch to an individual who does something that's either intentionally fraudulent, negligent, or malicious. So if a partner is stealing from the company, there's going to be some issue there. Um, you know, we're talking about somebody who's acting in good faith. They're not gonna be liable for the, just the general debts of the corporation, of the, the partnership. All right. So this is probably the most common type of, of entity that people um, talk about or form these days. And the reason is, is that it's, it's actually really, uh, I would say like a marriage of, of, of different entities. So a limited liability company is filed, is formed by filing the articles of organization with the state and the owners are actually called members and you have to have a minimum of one member. But what's so great about this type of company, this type of entity, is that it functions like a partnership. So there's not a lot of strict formality, um, but you get the liability protection that stockholders of a corporation would get. So it, it almost mixes the ease of administration, so to speak, of a partnership with the protection of a corporation. The other thing that's so uh, great about this, this entity is that you have a lot of options as far as taxes go. If a single individual forms an LLC, it's considered a disregarded entity. So what this means is that it's essentially all of the, the taxes are going to pass through. You're not going to file a separate return for your LLC. It's going to be passing through to your own taxes. If you have two individuals, the default is to tax it as a partnership. But with an LLC, you can make an election to have your taxes, um, have your company taxed as a corporation. So you have, again, that ability to receive the benefits of tax benefits of a corporation, but you're still operating under a less strict, stringent, um, I guess, formality while having that liability protection. And then the other entity that I want to talk about is the corporation. So as I'm talking about this, think of this as the traditional stock corporation. So it's a corporation that has stock. The owners are called stockholders or shareholders. They also have the limited liability protection. And this is formed by filing the articles of incorporation with the state. So this is a separate legal entity from the partner. There is, uh, it's just considered, the corporation just consider it as its own person almost. It's not one and the same, like we talked about back with sole proprietorship. Um, and most people have heard about this, uh, this double taxation, um, I guess, idea when it comes to the corporation. And, and the reason that is, is because the corporation is going to file its own tax return 
that's going to pay taxes on the profits of the corporation. But distributions to shareholders, that's how the shareholders receive funds in a corporation, they receive distributions. The shareholders, I'm sorry, dividends. The shareholders are also going to pay tax on the dividends. So that's kind of where you see the, the double taxation um, come to play. So with the corporation, you have the most formalities. So the state requires that you have at least one director. So the directors are the individuals who are gonna oversee the corporation and elect the officers. The corporation is required to have a minimum of three officers, which is the president, secretary, and treasurer, but you can have more. So you can have a number of vice presidents, um, you know, you can have a CEO. There's there's other um, positions that, that can be elected, but these are the, the baseline. And this is going to offer the strongest liability protection. But with that, again, comes the highest costs and the most formalities. The other thing that you have with a corporation is the ability to raise funds through a sale of stock. It's a lot harder with some of the other business entities to raise funds because um, you know, in the beginning, especially banks are going to be looking at your personal credit because you don't have the, you know, the, the background and, and the experience necessarily, unless you've run some other businesses in the past. So um, this is definitely something that would be a consideration depending on, you know, really what the plans are for uh, the business growth and where you're going to go. And so this is just a general overview. There are different, um, different types of corporations. Um, I don't want to delve too far into it. So there's you know, corporations that are um, tax exempt for charities, non-stock corporations. Um, but this is meant to just be more of a, a general overview um, of, the different, of the different common structures. So what I want to tell you, <laughs> and this is always, um, I think people always say, and they roll their eyes, well, yeah, consult with an attorney, consult with a CPA. You can really see, based on the different tax implications that the multiple structures um, can have, it is important to consult with a CPA. Everybody's situation is different, depending on um, what other businesses you may have or your just your current situation. Um, certain entities may be better than others it's always wise to consult with the CPA and consult with an attorney if you have questions about the, the structure. So if, um, I'm gonna open it up now if there's any questions about these um, initial business structure topics, please put them in the Q&A box. Hi, Christian. There yeah. are a few questions I can ask. Frank wants to know, can you change the way you are taxed with an LLC or once you pick one way, do you have to stick with that each successive tax year? Right. So when you initially form the LLC, it's going to default you based on whether one member or two members. So if it's one member, it'll default you initially to a, um, a disregarded entity, single member or partnership if there's more than one. You can make the election to be taxed as a, a C as an S corporation or something along those lines, you can change that election. Um, you're not you're not married to it, but what you will need to know and get advice on along the way is there are sometimes certain limitations or requirements in order to um, qualify for for those those types of um, designations. The other thing, just to dovetail on that, is that you're not even married, you know, to the type of entity. Maryland has allowed now to change and convert your entity to a different entity. So um, there are instances where if you start as a, an LLC, you could convert the entity to a different type. So that is something that it would need to um, make sense for you um, after reviewing your, your circumstances, but it, it can be changed. And another question is, are there specific uh, licenses or uh, backgrounds for accountants to do taxation assistance for LLCs particularly as opposed to individual tax accountants? Are there different? Are there any specific type of tax accountants that are uh, primarily focused on assisting LLCs? Oh, um, 
not to, I mean, not to my knowledge, I think if you found a, a qualified CPA, they're going to know the code and be able to assist you um, and be able to tell you based on your circumstances and as the business grows, is there a necessity to change the way you are being taxed? Um, one of the things that may trigger a change in, in taxation would be going from having no employees to having um, employees. But I, I don't, I think if you find a qualified CPA, they should be able to, to assist you along the way. Okay, and John wants to know, uh, is there a minimum threshold for income that you can earn with an LLC in order to keep the business alive? Or no. if you don't make enough money for the business for the first few years, will, you, will that have consequences or will you have to disband it? So not with the actual existence of the entity. Once you form the entity with the state, um, the entity is there. As long as you meet the annual requirements, which I will be talking about later, the entity is going to exist. Whether or not it is a good business venture to continue with is a different question. Um, if you're not meeting certain income requirements, um, you know, it may affect whether or not you even have to, to report income if I think it's $600 um, before you have to, you know, over that you have to report the income. So whether or not it's, it's a good idea to continue with the company is different, but once it's formed, as long as you are um, meeting the annual requirements, the state will recognize that as an entity. Okay. And Amy is just starting her business and is currently a sole proprietor, has not created an LLC. She's currently volunteering services as a contractor and is paid for services as well. Uh, the question is, how do I declare taxes on what I've earned? So that's definitely a question that you want to talk to a CPA about. Um, they're going to look at your overall situation um, one thing that I don't do is I don't offer tax advice other than very generally, you know, what I'm talking to you about here. I don't know enough about your specific situation, but I would suggest that you, you know, you do go talk to a CPA about that. And Jane wants to know, are there annual requirements as a uh, sole owner? And just to expand on that, are there annual requirements for an LLC to be seen as a valid entity? And are there annual requirements if you are a sole proprietor as opposed to an LLC? Right. So what I will be talking about is the, the annual filing requirements. So for the entities that you have to file with the state of Maryland um, for registration, you have to file an, an annual report, a personal property return every year, and there's a $300 fee. So I will be touching on that a bit later. Um, but you don't have to file anything formal with the state for a sole proprietorship or a general partnership to be um, to be considered that entity. It's an unincorporated entity, so you don't have to do that. But once you have filed with the state and you are one of the other incorporated entities, then yes, there are some requirements. And, and I definitely will, will let you know about that. No more questions for now. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to talk to you about how to actually go ahead and form the entity. So as we talked about, um, other than a sole proprietorship and a general partnership, um, we, you are going to be filing online with the Maryland State Department of Assessment and Taxation, and that's commonly referred to as ESTAT. Uh, over the past few years and over the pandemic, the ESTAT has done a really nice job in streamlining what can be done um, online. So what used to take a longer process is now much quicker. Um, and there's a lot more things that you can file online that you used to not be able to do before. So um, the things that you're gonna do is, is file online. You gotta have your name and we're gonna talk a little bit about trade names, trademarks, the distinction. Um, we're gonna talk about what a resident agent is and why it's important. You're gonna wanna get your federal tax identification number. And then I'm gonna touch on some licenses and permits. So what I've done here is I've, I've screenshotted essentially the, um, the I put my, my own firm in here. So McManus Lohmeyer Law Group, I've, I've gone in and screenshotted what it looks like. If I were to log on to the Maryland Business Express, which I put the address in here for you, this is where you're gonna go to actually register the business. 
um, the first thing it's going to do is ask you to put the name in and it's going to search for you to determine if somebody else is already using the name. What you need to know about in Maryland is that um, there can be the same name with a different uh, for a different business structure. So you can see here, I know it's small, but it says McManus Lohmeyer Law Group LLC. So my firm is an LLC. There, someone could register a McManus Lohmeyer Law Group Incorporated. Um, and so we'll talk about why sometimes having a trade name might be important. But if you go through this process and you click that blue box there that says search names and um, it clears you, that means your name is good. No other business has that name with that structure that you're choosing and you can go ahead and start the registration process. So what I have here is the public record information that anybody could pull up by going to the SDATS website. And you again at the top can see that this is my, uh, my law firm here. And you see, <coughs> excuse me, the principal office address, the resident agent, you see the active status, good standing status, you can see my actual date of formation. Um, and some of the information is not listed because my entity structure is an LLC. If you have a corporation, you're gonna see the state of formation, I'm sorry, the stock status and the uh, closed corporation status, if that applies. So this is the information that is of public record. And a copy of your articles of incorporation will be public record as well. Um, what you, what you will, what you need to know essentially is that you don't have to have anything pre-prepared. The website will prompt you to enter the information and then it'll generate the document for you. So when you're talking about choosing a name, um, again, again, like I had mentioned, the, the website's gonna do the search for you to let you know whether or not you can select the name that you would like to have. Um, when it comes to the suffix or the tail of the company, each type of structure is going to have a different ending. So you can see here, these are all the different types of suffixes that can be selected for your type of entity. So there's really no restriction on a partnership because you're not really filing a partnership and a uh, sole proprietorship can still file for a trade name, however. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, a limited partnership can have LP in those designations, a limited liability partnership, you see those designations, um, and down to corporation. So those are all the different um, suffixes, and you'll be asked to pick one when you actually file through the Business Express. So trademarks and service marks are filed separately at the state level with the Maryland Secretary of State. So trademark is for um, you know, the logo that you have to designate your goods. Service mark is for services. So this is filed at the state level. So this is gonna give you state protection. The United States Pat Patent and Trademark Office is where you get federal protection. Um, whether or not you need to file for a federal trademark is debatable. Some people think that they should do it right away. Um, you know, that really depends on your, I guess, your plans for the growth of your business. If you're in Maryland and you plan on keeping a business that's somewhat small, you don't plan on expanding to any other states, you may not need to spend the money to file for the federal trademark. But again, these, the, you know, that's very specific to your circumstance. Um, what is separate from that is, is a trade name, which is also filed with the State Department of Assessment and Taxation. And you file that on um, the Maryland Business Express website, the same place where you file to form the company. And so you will see, I, my firm has a trade name. So we go by Ally Legal Planning, and that is not the actual name of the entity. So McManus Lohmeyer Law Group, LLC, is the entity, but our name to the public is our trade name, Ally Legal Planning. So when you look that up on the Maryland Business Express website, it shows you who the owner is, shows you the address where the trade name is being used um, and when it was filed. So trade names have to be renewed um, every five years, I believe, and you will get notification 
from the state when the renewal is coming. It's very important that you always make sure to maintain your most current address with the state because they will um, be sending all the notices to the address on file. All right. So are there any questions about the, the practical formation portion of starting that entity in the state of Maryland? Thanks, Kristen. One question from Frank is whether the trade name is the same as the DBA or doing business as designation. Yeah, so they're both fictitious names, um, trading as or doing business as you can register. It, when you register with the state of Maryland, it's being registered as a trade name, but essentially it's the fictitious name that you are holding yourself out to the public as. So, you know, for the, for the purposes of what you're asking, it would be the same. And the second question is whether the tax filing is annual or quarterly, or are there requirements for tax filing? One, I guess, if you're doing federal taxes versus the Maryland state tax reporting requirement. Yep. So, you know, your taxes are due as of April 15th, barring, you know, the last few years when we've had some, uh, the last few years have been a little bit different. But, um, you know, if, you're, if your CPA doesn't file an extension, your taxes are due. Uh, the same thing is going to happen with the annual registration. Um, you're gonna file those reports by the April 15th, unless you have an extension. And um, what you'll see is that the, the state of Maryland, basically they're gonna, the comptroller is gonna certify a list of all the companies by September 30th who didn't do it. And um, what I'm gonna show you further down is what happens when you fail to do that. Um, you know, the, it's two different processes. So you need to file your federal taxes and your state taxes, but the annual return is separate, but it has significant consequences because it affects the standing of your business with the state of Maryland. And the last question for this section is, does the information that you've provided thus far, does it relate to web-based businesses as opposed to businesses in a physical location? No, so this is just the, this is for all businesses that you are filing that are going to operate in the state of Maryland. So if you're choosing one of the entities that requires registration, then you're going to go ahead and um, file. You used to be able to walk down to the SDATS office and you could do it. Uh, you could form the entity right there in person the same day. Um, since the pandemic, they've really beefed up their online presence and have made it a lot easier for individuals to file online. Um, part of that had to do with you know, just safety as far as, you know, people coming in person, but, it, you know, it, it facilitates people's ability to um, form these businesses. So doing it online is, is actually pretty, um, pretty quick and, and painless. And then the last question is, uh, can you start an LLC using the, your residence as the address for the business and is it wise to do so? You can. So really the only restrictions for addresses is that you can't have a, a PO box or one of those um, businesses that, you know, it looks like, looks like a, a street address, but it's actually a, a mailbox um, because you can set up a mailing address that's separate, but the principal office needs to be a physical location in Maryland and the resident agent needs to be a physical location in Maryland. It's not a PO box. And there is an easy form that you will file when you update your address. So when you change uh, change your address, if you move into a, a commercial space, you can just file a resolution that will change the address. Same thing with the resident agent. You can file that online straight through this Business Express. Um, but really, it just has to be, it's the place where the state knows to get a hold of you. So you want it to be somewhere that's reliable. Okay. And I'll ask the other questions after your next section. Okay, great. So this here is the resident agent requirement. So when you form your business with the state of Maryland, you need to have a resident agent. And this person is the person who's gonna be designated to accept service of process in the event of a lawsuit. 
And so as I just mentioned, the address has to be a physical location, not a PO box. Um, in Maryland, you can have an individual, a corporation or an LLC be the resident agent. Um, this can be helpful because there are businesses, their whole business model is to just be resident agent for um, other companies that, and basically this is very helpful too if you don't live in the state of Maryland um, and you have a Maryland business because the resident agent needs to be somebody who's either a resident or the corporation has is, is got some domicile in Maryland. So the resident agent doesn't have to be somebody who's involved in the business. Um, sometimes it's an attorney. Sometimes it is just the business owner. It can be that corporation that was hired just to be the resident agent. Um, it's something that I think doesn't get a lot of um, consideration. People think, all right, I have a resident agent, that's fine. But it's important to have somebody have a correct location and maintain that information with the state. And the reason being is that the rules of court allow that if a company doesn't have a resident agent or the resident agent can't be found, the resident agent has passed away or simply you never updated and you, the, an individual who, or company who may be suing your company can't find your resident agent service of process can be made on some other individual. And the language is so very broad. It says someone who could be authorized essentially to accept. Well, what does authorized to accept service of process really mean? There are so many instances that I've seen in the past where sheer oversight because somebody forgot, resident agent wasn't updated. Service of process was made on somebody who had no business receiving service of process. The company owners or individuals who needed to know were never notified and all of a sudden there was a judgment against the company and before they knew it the bank account was being garnished and they never even saw it coming so you know it's it's one of those situations where it's here for a reason it's important don't overlook it um it's a simple thing to update as, as things change and it's just something that um you know sh shouldn't be overlooked so after the business is formed on Maryland Business Express, you're gonna get a notification. It's taking right now around three to five days. It just depends on you know, time of year. At the beginning of the year, a lot of businesses are formed. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. After the business is formed, you're gonna go get that federal tax ID number. Um, you can apply online. And I have the uh, web address here for the IRS. Um, the IRS site that allows you to apply for the federal tax ID number. So this is the ID number that is going to be assigned to the entity and you need this to open the bank account. This is going to be the number that's given when you um, as a business apply for certain things, um, credit if you're setting up an account. It's basically the social security number for the entity. Um, you're gonna need it to pay the taxes. You're gonna need it when you hire employees and whenever you're applying for licenses and permits, it's again, it's your identifier. So this is something that you can apply for online. Um, you can also, if you have a CPA, they can do that for you. Attorneys do it for you as well. Um, but this is an important piece of the puzzle in being able to take the next steps after the business is formed with the state. And then this is a real big one and it, and it can be broad. Um, you need to make sure you have the right licenses and permits. So depending on what you are doing, what the primary business activity is, you need to get specific licenses and permits. So if you're involved in an activity that's federally regulated, then you're going to have to make sure that you have the right licenses and permits on a federal level. Um, there's also your industry specific licenses. So for instance, I'm an attorney, I have to be licensed to practice law. Um, construction workers, if they're doing, um, you know, residential, they have to be licensed with the Maryland Home Improvement Commission. Um, you know, so those types of things that are specific to your industry. Then there's also state and local licenses and permits. So depending on where you are, one of the best resources that you can have is to go to the clerk of the court. Um, so the Howard County Circuit Court has a licensed department who can help you get certain licenses. 
And um, the other address here that I have put down is the onestop.maryland.gov. There, uh, again, is a beautiful resource that you can go to. So if you are, say, uh, let's go back to the contractor example, you're going to be doing home renovations. You need to be licensed with the MHIC. You can go ahead and type in the Maryland Home Improvement Commission. It's going to pull up the license that you need, and it's going to give you step-by-step -step instructions of how to get that license, how much it costs, what you have to do. So for um, that license in particular, I think it even shows you you have an optional class that you can attend. So it's, it's a really good resource. Um, play around with that if you're looking for a certain industry because they lay that out for you and they tell you right there what it's going to cost and what you need. And then you're going to have your state accounts um, that you need to apply for as well, depending. So if you're going to have employees, you need that unemployment account, um, you need that income tax account. So again, there's, there's forms that CPAs can help you fill out or you can do it yourself. There's a lot of resources um, it's like the best and the worst this these days. It's every every bit of information is at your fingertips, but at the same time, it can be information overload. So, you know, it's it's there. You just need to make sure that you're looking at the right thing. All right. So, any questions about this section? One follow up from the uh, prior question about leasing your residence. If you are in fact renting your residence. Are there any restrictions on using uh, your address as the business address? Yeah, so I mean, if you're gonna use your, your home as your business, um, then you would list your business, your home as the business's principal address. Um, really, you would need to look at the industry specifics. So say for instance, you were a hairdresser and you were gonna operate out of your home. Um, there may be some zoning requirements or things local to the, uh, the geographic area. Um, you know, your, your CPA can talk to you about what you can deduct as far as home expenses and all of that, but you can, you, you can operate out of your home. It's just a matter of making sure that, that you are, you know, following the state and local, local requirements. And and, and also just to follow the lease agreement that one may have might also have some limitations. So just checking your lease agreement as well if you're renting your residence. Oh, right. Yeah, if you are, right. So uh, especially with residents. Another question is, uh, one other question is, um, how do you find a good CPA? Well, what are some of the tricks of how to find someone that may be may be very effective as, as an accountant. Well, certainly I think if you, if you have a certain area that, or industry that you're interested in breaking into and you know of other individuals who are in that industry, certainly asking around and getting referrals um, is great. If you have a professional relationship already with an attorney, they're usually a great uh, place to start because most attorneys and CPAs um, work together and can, you know, point you to people who are, um, you know, going to going to treat you right and know what they're talking about. Um, the other thing is that it's always a good idea to just talk to a few people. You're going to get a gut reaction. One to the person, do you drive with them? Are they providing you more information than just answering the questions that you have? Um, you know, those types of things are going to let you know. It, it's always worth it, just like you would for um, an attorney or anybody else that's going to be doing something important for you. You know, talk to more than one individual. Any other questions? Uh, we'll hold off for the next section. All right. So this section is going to be called um, contracts and documents because it's very broad. Um, and I'm going to break it up into two, two main sections. So the first is going to be contracts between the owners of the company, if there's more than one, and the documents that are going to govern the day-to-day -day responsibilities. Um, the second part is going to be the contracts for your day-to-day -day operations. So it's extremely, extremely, extremely important 
when you have more than one owner of a business to make sure that you have an agreement between the business owners. It's called different things based on what entity you have. So it's a partnership agreement for a partnership, operating agreement for an LLC, stockholders, agree stockholders agreement for a corporation. Corporations also have bylaws. So what are these documents? These are the documents that basically outline the, um, you know, the, the day to day operations of the owners, what's expected of the owners, how the business is going to be run. And one of the most important things is what happens when one of the owners wants to leave the company. So people sometimes have uh, buy sell agreements um, that are separate, but a lot of the times you see these provisions written straight into the operating agreements or the stockholders agreements. And you need this in place so that everybody from the outset of the business knows what the protocol is going to be. So if you have an individual who wants to leave, you don't want them turning around and selling their interest or their stock to somebody that you have never met before. You have no idea what type of person they are. Do they have any background for the business? You know, a lot of the time what you see is that people will set up a, an agreement where if somebody wants to leave, the company or the other member or stockholder gets the first option to purchase that interest back. Um, you know, and that's basically to eliminate any question of how it's going to go. And it's not just when somebody wants to voluntarily leave. What happens if somebody passes away? What happens if somebody becomes disabled and can no longer perform for the company? If they're a passive investor, may not be as big of an issue as somebody who may be managing the day-to-day -day operations of the business. It's also extremely important to outline what individuals can do and when they have the authority to do it. So the talks, these, these agreements will talk about voting and what percentage of votes you need in order to pass certain things. A lot of the time when you have one or two individuals who are managing a business, these agreements will lay out the specific tasks or um, duties that these individuals can take of their own accord and then certain things that require consent of all the owners. So just like, for example, you may have one individual who's managing the day-to-day -day operations of a company. The operating agreement may say they have authority to make payments or take loans up to $5,000, but anything over that requires the um, agreement of all the partners or all the owners. And so that's there as a mechanism to make sure that everybody is on the same page and everybody's doing um, what they all should be doing and that everybody knows how it's gonna go. It's, it's basically, think of it as insurance. Um, you don't expect that if you go into business with a best friend and everything is wonderful that there's ever gonna be a problem down the line, but it happens. Um, there's nothing more messy than a business divorce between two people who don't have an agreement in place that says, if somebody wants to go, how are we gonna value the business? who's going to buy the other person's share and what happens. It can cost a lot of time and a lot of money in court. So what you have to remember is that if it's not written down, then if there's ever a dispute, the law is gonna look at what the default provisions are. And if, if it's not in your favor, or if it's not written, then it's just going to be interpreted. So I can't stress how important it is to have these agreements. And sometimes people, you know, when you're starting a business, you think everything's going to be great. You don't want to think necessarily about um, things going south, but you know that's kind of the same reason. You know, I do wills as well, and it's like people don't want to think about dying, but we also need to remember that it's important to put down where our assets are going to go after we're we're gone. So this is the same thing. It's putting everything down on paper and making sure that everybody knows how the um, the growth and the the day to day operations of the business are going to go. And so the other part of that is just your day-to-day -day contracts. So um, if you have a commercial space and you're going to enter into a lease or you're selling a product and you have general terms and conditions, contracts are important. One of the worst things that you can do, however, and this goes back to my comment about the best of times and the worst of times, everything's available online. 
don't just grab a contract that you found online um, that can get you in a lot of hot water. I know a lot of people um, who have pulled contracts that they've seen from the internet, pulled contracts that um, other, other companies have used, and there can really be some things in there that if you're not paying attention to the details can come back to bite you. Um, one of the things that you typically see in a contract is um, a venue and jurisdiction provision for disputes. Um, somebody in Maryland had pulled a contract from the internet and a dispute arose and they went to, you know, sue somebody for services performed and the contract said all disputes had to be in North Carolina. You know, and it's not that you can't eventually get where you need to go, but it causes a lot more delay and conditions, you know, and in, in time and money, essentially, um, when you're just pulling things that aren't specific and intentional for your own business. Um, the other thing is independent contractor employment contracts. When is it important to have those? You know, all these things are very um, specific to each person's business. And it's a good idea to speak to a professional, um, even if you have your own contract, just to have it reviewed every now and then to make sure that, that you know, all the laws that change and, and everything that you're up to date and that you're doing what you need to do. All right, any questions about these contracts? Uh, one question uh, going back to the residence issue. If someone has a, uh, uh, two residences, one primarily here in Maryland and has a residence in another state as well or another nation, uh, in, uh, Native American uh, uh, nation here in the United States, um, are they able to have the business address in, a, in the nation, in the Navajo nation separate, even though they file their taxes in Maryland? So can you have the business address in a separate uh, state as opposed to where you personally file your taxes for re for residence purposes. So if you're if you're forming the a Maryland business, you need to have an address in Maryland, but you can have a mailing address that's somewhere else. Um, I, I am not I'll, I'm not familiar with uh, this circumstance in particular. It just hasn't come up, but. I know you can change your mailing address essentially to be anywhere, but you need to have the principal office in the state. And what if you are doing business in the state of Maryland, but plan to sell uh, goods in other jurisdictions? Do you have to establish a presence in the other states as well? So that's going to depend. Um, on each circumstance. So particularly if you have an online business and you are shipping goods, you know, there's there's a lot of factors that are taken into consideration as to whether or not you have a presence in another business, uh, another state that would warrant the filing. So you, it's called a foreign filing essentially. So you can have a Maryland business and you file a foreign qualification in say Virginia or DC if you are performing work there. Um, if you're if you have a physical location in the other state, you should file there. It gets a little more tricky, like I said, when you have you know an online um, an online business. But you know if you're if you're marketing to a different state, if you are intentionally you know if you're doing meetings in a different state, it's likely that it could be considered you're going to uh, be doing business in that state and you should be registered. But again, that's going to be a um, situation specific um, circumstance, and, and you should really seek counsel on that um, independently. No other questions. Okay. All right. And so the last topic I want to cover, um, I'm calling this best practices to maintain protection. Um, so the reason that you, you know, one of the reasons you're starting up the, the business entity separate and apart from yourself as a sole proprietor or a general partnership is so you have that liability protection, but it's not, you know, light switch, you file it, you have the liability protection. There are things you have to do along the way to make sure that that liability protection is maintained. So one of the things that you wanna do is make sure that your personal assets and your, your entity assets are kept separate. Don't commingle funds, don't take 
money that you're receiving from your for your LLC, for instance, and put it in your personal bank account um, and make sure that you're keeping your books and your records properly. Um, this is one of those items that is usually touched on in the uh, those governance documents that I was mentioning, you know, the operating agreement and, and all of that talks about how books and records should be maintained when the owners get access to that, et cetera. And again, along with commingling, you want to make sure that you're conducting business in the name of the company, not your own name, and that you have company bank accounts and credit cards that are separate from your own. Um, you want to do, you know, the whole point of this liability protection is to keep your personal assets safe and separate and away from the business debts. So don't do anything to commingle them. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, you can have the liability protection, but if you do something that's intentional, it's malicious, it's fraudulent or negligent, you could still have liability. So it's not a 100% um, guarantee that there's no personal liability, but you know it is a high standard. Um, you wanna make sure that you have good insurance and different industries need different insurances. And um, that's one of those things that will help protect you in the event something were to happen, say you were um, you know, in a dispute, the insurance could help. And then having that good network of professionals, having your CPA, having your attorneys, other business uh, industry professionals that have done this um, can really be instrumental in making sure that that liability protection is maintained. The other thing I wanna talk about is signing contracts and documents. So as I mentioned, you need to make sure that you're doing business in the name of the company. There's a specific way that you should be signing all of your business documents to make sure that you are signing um, on behalf of the company. So you can see here, I've got two examples of a corporation and an LLC. You are signing indicating that you are acting on behalf of the company. You don't wanna just sign your name with no other um, notation. So you can see under the incorrect, it doesn't, it's not even a name of a company. Uh, listed. But even if you're signing in one of these correct manners, you need to be on the lookout for the personal guarantee language, which could be located in a document. Um, as I mentioned before, when you start out, sometimes you just, you know, you don't have that credit, you haven't been in business. So certain banks, um, lenders may require a personal guarantee from you. That is something that means you're going to be personally liable. So it, it almost removes that um, liability protection that you get with the company, but it's specific to that loan. So a lot of the time you'll see if you're a new business and you uh, lease commercial space, the landlord may want a personal guarantee that you as the owner are going to pay the rent um, along with the company so that if the company doesn't pay the rent, the landlord can come after the owner for the rent. So keep an eye on that. The language usually says something like, John Doe individually and on behalf of the company. And then this is the slide that um, several people have asked questions about so far. So here we go. Um, this is the annual personal property return and annual fee that we've been talking about. So Maryland, you're required to file the personal property report with the state of Maryland by April 15th. It's a $300 fee every year. Um, if that is not filed, by September 30th, and the comptroller is gonna to certify to the State Department those companies that have failed to do so. The Again, the beautiful thing about the Maryland Business Express is that you can file it right from that uh, page that has your company information. So if you remember that page that had McManus Lomar Law Group and it had my principal address, resident agent, all that, you can file there. Um, if you don't file, then the, what the state does is it, it can repeal and annul or forfeit your charter. So you will see where my, uh, my entity said good standing. So I filed everything that I needed to file for my company to date. If it says forfeited, then that affects your ability to do business in the state of Maryland. And it's really, really, really important because if, you know, depending on the type of entity that you have, if you have a forfeited LLC, then technically you're forfeiting the right to do business in the name of the company. So what does that mean? You can't do business in the name of the company. Um, if you're sued, you can defend an action in court, but you can't sue someone. 
So if you have a statute of limitations issue, so in Maryland, you have for, I'm going to generalize here, you have generally a three-year statute of limitations, depending on what the issue is that you can sue somebody for. If you're coming up on that three years, but your company is forfeited, you can file a lawsuit, but it might get kicked out by the court or the defendant might get it kicked out. So it's extremely important to make sure that you're um, maintaining these annual filings. With a, a corporation, it's, it's similar. It is, ceases to exist as a legal entity. So if you, this legal entity is no longer in good standing, then what happens to your limited liability protection? So it's really important to make sure that these annual reports are, um, are filed. If though something happens and you enter a forfeit status, you can fix it. Um, it's not, you know, what you can do is you can go in and file all of the returns that are late or missing. You're going to pay a penalty, but you can reinstate the company and you'll be good to go. This is something that sometimes CPAs will do for you every year. You can do it yourself. Again, as I said, it's right there on that Maryland Business Express um, website, but it's not something that should be overlooked. So questions on this? Uh, Mark wants to know if you form a, a, a consultancy or operate as a consultant and provide services in other states or nationwide, but your primary business address and uh, function is in Maryland, what are some of the considerations that you may need to, to have operating as a consultant to other companies in other states? So if you're talking specifically about whether or not you, if you have a registered business here, whether you need to be registered in another state, again, that's going to be um, a review of many different factors. So whether or not you're actively uh, soliciting business in other states, how you're soliciting business in other states. Um, you know, if you're not, if you don't have employees in other states, if it's just you and you're sitting in your house, you know, then that's a different story versus you traveling to meet with clients and, and consulting on location. So that's going to require just an overall look at your, at the way you run your business, the way it's been set up. Um, as far as other considerations, it just depends. It, I didn't see from the question, it didn't say if there was an entity, did it, David? Uh, no, it said that uh, if one operates as a consultancy or as okay. a consultant. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're operating as a sole proprietorship, then you're operating uh, with less stringent formalities. But if you have filed in the state of Maryland as an LLC, uh, or a corporation, then you you know you have to meet the the annual requirements and then the formalities here in the state of Maryland to maintain your your good standing. You know the other question, thing. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the other thing I was going to say is that if you are uh, conducting business, either selling goods or particularly services on an ongoing basis, like consultants, um, having those contracts for services can be important. Again, going back to the comment about choosing venue and jurisdiction um, if a dispute were to arise. If it's your contract, you can sort of um, guide that to say any disputes need to be handled in the state of Maryland so that you, know, you don't have to fly out to wherever and you have home field advantage as far as uh, resolving disputes. So those are the types of considerations that you would uh, wanna think about. Okay, and the next question is, is there any particular type of entity that's better for protecting your personal assets? either as a corporation or an LLC, or is there a difference? Yeah, I mean, so think about it more as, um, I think between an LLC and a corporation, they both protect your personal assets. They just offer different, um, you know, different methods, I would say methods of like day-to-day -day management. So the LLC is gonna be a little, less uh, stringent. You have more flexibility like a partnership in the day-to-day -day management. It's a little less formal. Um, the corporation is going to have a lot more formalities. It can sometimes be more costly to initially set up, but you have the ability to, um, you know, issue stock raise funds that way. The LLC provides a lot of flexibility as far as tax, you know, how you want to be taxed. From a liability standpoint, though, to me, if you choose either of those 
structures, you are protecting your assets. It's really more of a tax consideration. And the last question is whether a corporation is taxed as an individual is taxed versus an LLC being taxed passing through to the members. So the corporation, when it's set up, if you don't make an election to be taxed um, separately, it, the corporation is a separate entity. It's going to pay, it's going to file its own tax return. The shareholders are just going to, you know, receive their dividend, their uh, distributions, and they're going to pay taxes on that. Um, the LLC, it just depends on how it's set up. So if you remember, if you're a single member and you set up an LLC, it's just going to default as uh, a pass-through entity straight to you. And if you set it up with two owners, it's going to default to a partnership. You have to file an election with the IRS to get the different tax status. So, um, you know, from a formation standpoint, as far as filing with the state of Maryland, there's not really a difference. If you're going to change the way the entity is structured, that's going to happen with an election um, to the to the IRS. No further questions. Okay. All right. So this is a list of resources here. Um, there's some really good resources. Again, the uh, the Maryland Business Express has a lot of, um, you can do a lot of filings directly on the website, but I wanna point out their resource tab because if you go to this section, it actually breaks out the different, um, I guess, stages of where you might be in your business, whether it's the planning stage, whether you're already formed, it has a lot of different resources there. Um, the Maryland Secretary of State I have listed this if you are interested in looking at the uh, trademark service marks. And then if you're gonna have employees go to the Department of Labor website. So they have all the information on minimum wage, posters you need to file, things like that. Um, I'm putting the SBA, the Small Business Association here because they have a, a nice guide about starting up a business, which you can find. And then same thing with this uh, Office of Attorney General Department of Commerce. They have a legal aspects of doing business guide. Um, there's just, it's a lot of good information in there, particularly if you're just starting out. So these are here. Um, and we've gone through questions along the way. If there's any other questions, please put them in the chat box now. This is my information. If you wanna reach out to me, please feel free. And um, I hope that you found this this useful. And again, just as a uh, just as David mentioned in the beginning, this is the disclaimer. This is meant to be a general overview. If you have specific questions about your specific situation, you should obtain legal advice from a licensed attorney or a CPA for your tax questions that are going to um, review your situation and and talk to you about that. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Kristen. Uh, appreciate your help and your assistance and you. uh, appreciate your, your time in uh, providing this really helpful information to everyone. And thank you, Becky and Rohini for facilitating this. Uh, just to add to what Kristen indicated, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Howard County Chamber of Commerce <clears throat> has a uh, uh, listing of really informative information as well, which is local to us here. And it's, it's a great organization as well to be a part of if you're starting a new business because you can get some great ideas from other fellow uh, business owners and new business owners as well. And I've highlighted the, the uh, website at the top. In addition to that, the uh, county uh, website has the local business initiative as well, which is also very informative and provides some interesting information as well uh, that you might find helpful. So we just wanted to bring that to the forefront and thank you again. And Rohini, I'll let you take it from here. Um, there are just a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if you have time to answer those. Uh, Jim is asking what are the sources of low cost legal help pro bono law clinics, uh, stuff like that. And uh, 
So That's some cool. of those questions, I don't see them on my screen. And so Rohini, if if they have been sent to you, uh, I, I do see one question here that asks, oh, I see, I didn't see this initially. Well, one question is what are the sources of low cost legal help uh, or online advisory references if, if you're aware, Kristen? Um, I mean, certainly I think looking at the, the um, so, so some of the local resources, if you go to the chamber, you can call, I would, if you go call the uh, the clerk of the court, as I had mentioned, the license department, they may be able to point you into um, the right direction. Uh, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know of anything um, that I can share at this moment. And one thing I, I uh, infer the answer, there is the Pro Bono Resource Center, which is located in Baltimore. And there are often new lawyers who are looking to have experience in a particular area of law. And sometimes they have a resource available for individuals looking for low uh, cost legal assistance and sometimes pro bono legal assistance. And sometimes for lawyers seeking to have um, uh, participation in their CLEs, it's free to lawyers who at least take on a pro bono client. So that's usually a good resource to find some legal assistance and the Maryland Legal Services is also an organization locally that provides uh, 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 low cost assistance for those seeking, uh, seeking lawyers uh, as well. They often deal with more with family law cases, but they may have references for business lawyers as well. Uh, Kristen, one other question is, if you form an LLC in a state that allows anonymity, uh, for example, Nevada, when you register as a foreign entity, can you keep that level of anonymity? That I do not know the answer to that question. Um, that's not something that, that I have dealt with. That is a great question. Uh, I just don't know the answer to that. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kristen, for uh, this very informative talk and for all of the questions that you've answered. Um, so we're gonna wrap up here and we're gonna send out a follow-up email uh, with a survey and we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your feedback. That's very important for us as we plan classes. Um, and I think uh, keep an eye out for our further uh, legal classes that are coming up. And again, thank you and good night for joining us today. And thank you, Becky, for being here today. Yeah, no problem. Hope everyone has a good evening. Thanks, Chris and David. Thanks, everyone, for Thank coming. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.